And we have a really interesting mix of uh, academics and activists and practitioners. And today's session is going to be chaired uh, by uh, Kaylee uh, Yen, um, who I first met when I started my project on the Taiwan Green Party back in December of 2012. And, and Kaylee then went on to play a key role in the Asia Pacific Greens network and then to move on to be the convener of uh, Global Greens. Um, and I'm going to hand over to, to Kaylee now to, to chair today's uh, session. OK, thank you, because David will also be joining as a speaker, so he'll be switching hats now. <laughs> um, well, good, good to see all of you from around the world joining in. I see people with a lot of different backgrounds, which is great because, as David said, we have uh, an interesting mix on the panel. Uh, several of us are actively, all of us are activists in one form or another, but uh, some of us came to this subject from more of an activist uh, uh, background, some from a purely academic, and others from um, uh, like me. I, 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 actually, you'll find that there'll be a lot of different, there's a lot of knowledge and experience on this panel. So our challenge will be to stay focused and on topic. And what's the topic? The speakers are all published authors. So we'll be seeking to hear from them about their experience researching um, green politics, what motivated them, uh, what challenges they, they faced in the process, both doing the research uh, and in publishing and in uh, distributing. Uh, so for those in the audience who are also thinking about uh, researching, publishing, this is the subject for you. But there's also a wild card element. Uh, I invite all of the part participants, uh, even you in the audience, to pose questions um, around the subject of researching and publishing and around green politics. Write your question into the chat box. You'll see a little chat icon on your screen. For me, it's at the bottom of the screen. I know on computers, it's sometimes on the upper uh, the top side of the menu bar. And I'll have a look at the chat box. Just want to check, David, is there a volunteer helping to also uh, keep an eye on questions as they get put into the chat box? Yes. I uh, Yes. OK, so then uh, I'll be getting some questions sent to me from um, some support. And then after, after each speaker gives their presentation about their own research, they'll be invited to ask a question uh, that they're curious about to the other speakers or to the audience members. Uh, and the next speaker will pick up on that question as well as answer the, the five main questions. And we'll continue that way for the first hour. The second hour, it'll be really an open discussion with everyone in this call, including the audience. Uh, so you'll be again invited to ask questions. Um, raise your hand if you really want to. If you have a burning question, then I can uh, call on you. Um, but I hope this will be more of a dialogue. <laughs> Fireside chat. We're all sitting in our different types of uh, rooms in our house, so it's all very comfortable and relaxed. So the five focus questions are, why did we start researching green parties in the first place? Uh, so what motivated our research? Second, what research methods did you use uh, in your publication? Three, who are you writing for? What's the audience that you're writing for? The fourth question is, what challenges have we faced in the process of doing this research and publishing? And five, how do we promote our work to a wider audience? So the speakers have about seven minutes to answer all those five questions, uh, as well as to ask a question uh, uh, onwards. So the first speaker will be David. Um, and I'll let you uh, kick it off and then I'll pick up once you're done. Take it away. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks for that, uh, Katie. So I'm going to talk briefly about my experience of uh, writing this book, uh, Taiwan's uh, Green Parties. Um, it was quite accidental for me to actually start getting into this uh, this project. Previously, I've re written largely on um, uh, mainstream political parties in Taiwan. I've done a little bit of research on Taiwan's smaller parties, um, but the key turning point for me was 
um, one of my students um, who um, happened to be a Green Party Taiwan uh, candidate um, and uh, also she was co-convener of the um, uh, Green Party Taiwan and she invited me to get involved in uh, researching uh, the Taiwan Green Party. So that led me to run a couple of focus groups in Taiwan that um, featured uh, Green Party candidates, leaders and activists. And as soon as I did those focus groups, which was where I met uh, first met Kaylee, I was really hooked on the topic because the participants were just so different from mainstream uh, party politicians that I was used to uh, working with. It was a long process putting the book together. Um, I started in December 2012 and the book only came out uh, in March of 2021. So what I try and do in, in the book is answer a number of big questions that looks at the development of the Green Party Taiwan's first 25 uh, years. So I looked at questions such as why did the party form? How did the party develop, particularly electorally and in terms of international engagement? Who is the Green Party? In other words, what kind of people have led the party and represented the party and what kind of people have supported the party? Um, and then much of the book really focuses on why questions. How do we understand why the party has changed in terms of the issues it focuses on, focuses on? And how do we best explain uh, the performance of the party? So, it's, so many of these questions that I'm looking at are uh, questions that the comparative studies on international Green parties uh, look at. Now, how did I kind of get at those, the answer to those questions? Well, over those eight years of, of research, I tended to have very short uh, research visits, often um, only about a month a year over those uh, eight years. And the kind of research methods I was using were also much more diverse than in my earlier studies on mainstream party politics. Um, I tended to use focus groups, for example, not only with elites, but also with party uh, members and supporters. Uh, I did supporter interviews and supporter surveys. Uh, as with my, a lot of my earlier work, I also spent a lot of time looking at campaign communication, ele uh, election advertisements, social media posts as a way of kind of measuring party change. And lastly, as with my earlier work, I did a lot of interviews. But the difference here was that I was interviewing people um, multiple times over those uh, eight years rather than just a snapshot of interviews. In terms of the key findings, um, I try to show that we need to look at both party system, but also inner party factors in terms of explaining the success and failure of the uh, of the party. Uh, essentially arguing that um, often it was strategic mistakes within the party's campaign that help us understand the limited impact of the uh, of the party. And one of the things that I also did that I hadn't done in my earlier work was to end the book with offering some suggestions for how the party could improve its electoral uh, performance. A further question that I wanted to touch upon was the who we are writing for uh, question. And what I try and do in the book is to write for multiple audiences. In other words, I'm trying to write for those that are interested in Taiwan's civil society and party system. But also, I'm also trying to write for people that are interested in comparative small parties and comparative green parties from a political science perspective, as well as those that support green parties internationally. Um, and also, I'm trying to make it relevant to the Green Party Taiwan uh, itself. Um, now, I think there have been challenges for this, uh, this project. One of them is the fact that because many academic books uh, only come out or mainly come out in hardback. So it's very, it's not so easy for us to actually uh, mass market these kind of uh, books. So the way that I've tried to deal with that is a much heavier promotional campaign than I've done for my earlier books. In other words, doing a, um, a world book online book tour in the US and, and Europe, radio shows, podcasts, fan page, um, seeking out book reviews. Um, so I'm basically going promotional crazy to try and uh, increase the impact. But overall, I, I feel the results have been quite mixed. In other words, I'm, I think I'm reaching the academic, uh, Asian studies academic audience, but I'm still struggling to break through into some of those target uh, groups. Uh, and that's something that I want to try and improve on in the future. In other words, try to run more diverse promotional events 
uh, that are um, to try and reach out to uh, to do events in Taiwan um, and um, but and also to do events with Green Party members and uh, supporters. And the other way that I'm trying to um, hit um, the uh, some of my target readership is I'm now working on a Chinese version of the of the book together with three former Green Party uh, Taiwanese Green Party leaders and uh, and candidates. Uh, and that's the thing that I'm particularly excited about uh, looking ahead for the uh, next uh, year or so. Um, and that's where I'm going to finish. Lastly, I have to say that this has been a, a really transformative experience for me. Uh, and it's definitely the most enjoyable research project that I've ever been in, involved in, partly because I really enjoy working with such uh, idealistic uh, individuals that make so many sacrifices for environmental and social justice. And I'm going to finish there. Thank you, David. I hope I was in on time. <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good example. Um, well, ne next we'll uh, have an early surprise. Uh, Ricky's having some troubles with his computer, so he asked that he go last on the list, which means that we'll now move to Arnie. Arnie, is that all right with you? Yes, of course. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, very well. So Arnie also has a very interesting background. He's a, a political scientist. He is an analyst and an advisor uh, on green uh, policy, uh, specifically with energy and democracy and coalition governments, which uh, is very exciting topics now, especially coming from Germany as they are about to go into elections in September. So uh, you can read more about Arnie's background on the uh, SOAS website. Uh, he's also a member of the Green Academy, which is associated with the Heinrich Böll Foundation, uh, a network of, of thinkers uh, from the political science world. Um, and he's he's worked uh, with the Greens in government uh, uh, in um, Baden-Württemberg. So he just has a lot of a wealth of experience. So Arnie, but before you get into the questions themselves, can you tell us also a bit more about the context of the topics you research on? What are some of the publications you, you've made? Um, so with that, take it away. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Kelly. It's my, my pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm here in, uh, based in Stuttgart in, in Baden-Württemberg in the southwest of the country. Um, and I wanted to share some, some of my uh, background or experiences on on researching on the German Greens, mainly this study is called German Greens and Coalition Governments. I did a successor then on, on the actual policy side of things, on governing ecologically. So what have the Greens achieved actually when they govern in Germany? And the, the motive, I, I mainly wanted to share uh, my, my motives why I did that and how the, how the research came together. Uh, it was mostly driven by, by personal experience. Um, uh, and as Kelly mentioned, I was involved with the Green Party before. I'm a member of the Green Party. I served as an advisor in the parliament on the national level and then worked as an advisor here in Baden-Württemberg, where the Greens are the strongest party and are leading the government. Uh, and at the time here in Baden-Württemberg, I took the job as what is called a strategic advisor of the strategy unit. Yeah, and it's an exceptional for the Green case because that kind of unit in a state government you only have in the main in the state ministry, the central ministry. And this is the only state where the Greens are strong enough that they run the government, that they are in the center. Uh, so I was in a, in a lucky position to, to do a job that no one else in the Green Party could do. But I also had to do things and tasks that I didn't really know how to do. Uh, so what I did at the time in 2013 was that I often called my, my former colleagues who I knew from way back then, who in the meantime joined also other state governments in other states in Germany. So in 2013, the Greens governed in nine out of 16 German states. Now, so basically, I tried to access my network and ask my, my former colleagues, well, how do you do this when your parliamentary group, you know, does a move like that and it doesn't really fit to your, to your agenda in the government? Um, or how do you manage conflicts with your coalition partner? And eventually I realized that there's a lot of knowledge out there among my green peers, but it's it's not really, it wasn't accessible. It only, you could only access it randomly by, you know, by just talking to some people and, and asking them. 
And it didn't take a long time that I that I stayed in the job. I, I, I quit the job for some personal reasons, but I realized then for me it was a fortunate timing uh, that I realized uh, I want to do this kind of research. I actually want to access and examine what are the experiences when the, the German Greens are moving from opposition party into government. Yeah, and what kind of uh, informal structures are being used, for instance, to solve coalition conflicts, or what kind of um, informal structures does the party build uh, to, to coordinate itself um, in government? And there's probably a very, uh, very characteristic issue for Germany's political system because of the way our federalism works. Um, so the Greens on the national level are an opposition party so far yet. Uh, the last time they governed was in, in the year 2005 on the national level. But as I said, on the state level, they govern in many, uh, gov uh, many states. And due to the federal character of the political system, they are an influential policymaker in national policy making because they, are, they have a, you know, almost a majority in the second chamber. Mm. And that's the reason why they formed a lot of uh, informal, uh, an informal coordination. So basically, my um, my idea was to to assess this and try to to describe what what has happened with the Green Party. I mostly had two target groups in mind, and they are both domestic. So this study was initially published uh, in German, uh, and I wanted to do it to assess this kind of knowledge for Green Party members, basically, for the next Greens to go in government that they would do would have something like a handbook. But I also wanted to contribute to the political science department debate. Um, and my background, basically, I'm a political scientist myself, but basically I'm a crosser. I'm a practitioner when it comes to politics, but I'm also a political scientist and I know at least you know a little bit of the methodology. Um, and so I wanted to combine that um, and I wanted to use my green network. Um, as, the, um, as the speaker before mentioned, um, I also used as, a, as the main tool for my research, I used uh, qualitative interviews. So basically I interviewed four, four dozen uh, Green Party politicians, uh, mostly the party leadership on the national level and the state level, and then also some, some key advisors. And given my background that I'm part of the, of the Green family, so to say, that made the access uh, more easeable, more easy for me, of course, that I was trusted by my interview partners, that I, I would not abuse confident information, so to say. So I think it, it gave me an opportunity to get unique access to high level decision makers and these uh, advisors that I could lay out, you know, how the how the party functions, how policy making functions. Uh, and I realized after finishing the study that this is something that all of the German parties who are in governing positions, they do have these informal party structures, for instance, or they do have informal coalition mechanisms, but this is not really being published. Uh, so this study is somewhat uh, a novelty in the German context because it gives insights that the parties usually hide. And that was the idea also by the Heinrich Böll Foundation, which is the a think tank affiliated to the Green Party. And their aim was to, to uh, contribute to making uh, politics more more transparent and to get a better understanding of where political decisions are being made. It's most often it is not in the formal bodies of, let's say, the parliament or the cabinet table, but the, the actual decisions are being made in, in other informal structures. So overall, I would say uh, um, the study received some good reception in, in Germany. The, the English translation is somewhat a, a co-benefit. I think it offers some more insights into Germany's federalism and the policy making here. Uh, and for me, last point, it is uh, it, it was a unique opportunity. I'm, I'm now working on very different stuff, but I realized uh, now coming to this election, as, as Kelly mentioned in the introduction, the German Greens are actually, we have elections in, in three months and the German Greens are in a very strong position and are likely to join the next national government. And basically my study also provides for me a blueprint to do a similar research uh, on the national level. And that is something that uh, I'm considering and I'm, I'm slowly preparing. Um, yeah, so I hope I, I, I could share with you some of the of the insights that are worthwhile to the discussion and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Aini. 
yeah, you've had a busy um, pan pandemic time. You've been doing a lot of research recently. All of us have, uh, it seems. It just occurred to me that I've been speaking quite fast because when I, I get excited about a topic, I speak even faster. So if, for any of the audience members, if we're speaking too fast, just uh, tell, tell me, put a little note in the chat box and I'll cut it and remind us to speak more clearly or more slowly. Um, so thanks for the feedback uh, in advance. So I we'll now move to the next speaker, uh, Kara, and she's uh, have a similar back, uh, field of research as Arnie. She's also been looking at the development of green parties, but this time from a Canadian perspective. She's a uh, lecturer of political science at the Simon Fraser University in Canada, and she's published several works uh, from a purely uh, political scientist perspective, not as an insider as Arnie has been, but from outside looking in at how has the Canadian Green Party evolved from a minor party to now an increasingly major party, uh, which is unusual in a first past the post electoral system. So that's quite different than uh, electoral system than we have in Germany. So Kara will tell us more about her research. Uh, over to you, Kara. And you're on mute, so just take off your mute. Yes, perhaps I can there share my know. slides now. Um, so. And I notice Arnie has just posted in the chat box a link to his study, German Greens and Coalition Governments. Are you able to see that? Are you able make to see that? Make a copy of that link for your records. Yes, Kara, I see your yep. presentation. Excellent, excellent, good. Yes, um, the, the uh, Green, Green Party of Canada was founded in 1983. Uh, it won its first seat in 2011, uh, but I became interested in the Green Party much earlier because around 2004, I noted that support for the Green parties was growing considerably in Canada, and especially where I reside in British Columbia. Um, and so I, um, I, they hadn't elected anyone yet. Um, this was a party that was historically considered a very minor party, receiving only 1% of the popular vote. But in some writings in, in, in the elections, provincial and federal elections at the time, uh, in British Columbia, support for the Greens was as high as 17%. Uh, Elizabeth May, as, as we know, was won uh, eventually in 2011 uh, with, um, and was re-elected again in 2015 and 2019. Uh, and so there was growing support. I also, also happen to be um, interested in the environment and in the relation between, I'm a political scientist, as Kelly said, I've done my doctoral degree at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, in Canada, postdoctoral uh, 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 with um, a fellowship uh, from Social Sciences and Research Council of Canada to, sp uh, to spend a year at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and then when I returned uh, to Br British Columbia, I had been studying the rise of um, different isms. Environmentalism was one of them. And I was interested in that because on a personal level, I have a garden here, as you can see from the pictures, a flower and vegetable garden. I grow my own food organically and locally. So I, I was in tune with uh, what the Green Party was talking about. So I um, did some research and uh, I uh, was actually preparing a course at Simon Fraser to, to teach. And then I, I decided to approach the executive of the Green Party of Canada. The leader at the time was Jim Harris and was given full cooperation by the Green Party to conduct as a political scientist, the first ever academic survey of the membership. Of 2,900 randomly selected members who received a questionnaire, 802 returned them completed. My analysis of the results of this survey has produced two papers uh, that I eventually published in academic journals. And this was one of the first, uh, some, I was told actually, had not been much written on Green Party of Canada in, in, by academics, by political scientists. And so this was one of the first ones that was done. And I tested some of the theories uh, used to support Greens in other countries, such as post-materialist thesis, 
new middle class thesis. These were theories that had been used to explain the rise of support of greens, for example, in Germany. Some of the methods that I've been using uh, have been similar to the ones uh, of, uh, used by other people on this panel, other experts, uh, mixed, uh, mixed methods research design. So I use both quantitative and qualitative approaches. And uh, I, um, I surveyed voters uh, in the last federal election and an important survey, uh, voters in British Columbia, which included over 100 Greens, and also have inter interviewed uh, candidates in the Lower Mainland and South and Vancouver Island, where they have earned more than 10% of the popular vote. I'm also an analyzing textual sources such as platforms and speeches that will help to validate the collection of material from the interviewees. The um, audience, the academic audience, uh, is primarily a, an academic one, but, um, and as I had indicated, um, there has been written, writ little written on the Green Party of Canada uh, in the past. Um, and therefore, the book that I, I, I hope to, uh, to finish um, will be one that will be per perhaps useful in a course in a political science course uh, or other courses at university, but it could also be a, a useful resource for journalists and for others, um, for Green Party supporters as well, uh, as well as uh, those uh, Greens outside of Canada in other countries where, where they're faced to similar uh, challenges, such as the first past the post system. Uh, the biggest challenge right now I'm having is the heat wave. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to keep all my vegetables warm, uh, and, but still not um, overheated. But um, in terms of challenges more, more recently, uh, as I indicated here, um, I think I'll just, I'll just talk for a while. <laughs> um, I can't see anybody. Um, what I will say is, uh, here I go, uh, is that, um, I face uh, several different challenges um, in terms of the, of the process of writing the, the book. Um, one has been that the, vo uh, the perception that the Green Party is really irrelevant or um, the issue of relevance really comes up a lot among uh, academics. Um, I'm often told, well, why are you studying the Green Party? Anyway, they, they, don't, they don't elect that many people, uh, or it used to be they didn't elect any. Um, and the Green Party is often perceived as, as a single issue party. Uh, so other parties can also deal with, with issues of environment. So why do we need a Green Party in our uh, already crowded first past the post electoral system? Um, but um, things are changing. And uh, there were some predictions that the Greens in this last federal election we're going to uh, win a um, great many votes uh, and seats, uh, actually six or seven seats in the 2019 federal election as the concern for climate change was growing um, and uh, among voters. And this is what I, I hope to ex explore further in the book um, is why the Greens failed to take advantage of the growing uh, awareness of climate change and other environmental issues when sometimes the green the, the environmental issues almost at the same level as the concerns about the economy uh, and um, another area that I've been exploring is is how um, this book will perhaps will I hope appeal to a broader audience more than just people who are interested in explaining the existence of the greens in Canada but also the the George general question of the role of political parties in the democratic system. Um, the issue of participatory democracy is um, seen as something that is almost as dear as at the hearts of many candidates, Green Party candidates who I've interviewed, as climate change. The aim is to make the, uh, the party more responsive to the grassroots, to a diverse set of interests. And I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed reading Fid's book on um, the study of green, the Green Party in Taiwan, where he 
applies in the Yid's theory, for example, about the role that mainstream parties, other parties, do in creating the environment for the Green Party to emerge or as can be presented as an obstacle. So I intend to explore further these new theories that have been developed. Some of these theories have come out of literature in Europe um, in the German uh, experience or French or English, but also I'd like to look at what has been the experience of Greens in Australia and New Zealand, which have uh, which uh, come out of the same British parliamentary system. And one thing that's it really is 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 coming out often is the fact that there is a party that is in the minds of many voters is also very green focused, and that is the NDP. And the NDP perhaps plays a similar role as the DPP in Taiwan. They often portray themselves as the environmental party, as the party for the environmentalists to support. But on the other hand, there's growing, growing alienation among environmental activists in the movement and growing strain between the labor union factions and the environmental factions within the NDP. The NDP is a socialist, a social democratic party. So I think that this book should be of interest to um, those who are studying the Canadian political system or who want to understand better what is happening to the Canadian political landscape, who are even who are not political scientists, but who have an interest in, in it. We've had a very interesting election um, and where there are new parties emerging, both on the right and the left. And then also the Greens have had um, a very important leadership race recently. Elizabeth May has stepped down and there is now a new leader. Um, and, but before this happened, um, there was a very extensive long leadership debate uh, and um, differences in factions within the Greens party has, has re resurfaced. Um, also, there's been a discussion a debate within the party as to what should be the best step forward to be more successful electorally and also to stay true to their principles. And there's a debate as to what they should stand for. How should they diversify in the minds of the public be beyond just a single issue party? Because that's one of their biggest challenges is that many people feel that it not, it's, and some people feel that it's a wasted vote. How can they show that there are, un unfairly perhaps, because the Greens do have an extensive platform, but most people don't read it. Uh, and so the leadership debate uh, has brought out a lot of divisions um, but uh, also a lot of issues in terms of what policies should they promote? Should it be cap and trade? Should it be carbon tax? Environmental policy debates and issues about what, what the Green Party is all about. Um, I have some questions for the, panel, the other panelists as well, but I guess that will come later. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Kara. It's interesting to hear some of the debates going on in the Canadian Greens because uh, I've observed the similar debates in almost all Green parties around the world. Uh, there are about a hundred Green parties around the world and they all seem to, all parties seem to go through a similar sort of developmental trajectory. Um, so we'll hear more about that actually in our next speaker's talk. Uh, James Marshall, he is also a speaker from Canada, from the Vancouver area, but he has a very different perspective from Kara. He's literally grown up in the Green Party. His father is one of the co-founders of the federal uh, Green Party of Canada, and so he's been marching on the streets probably before he could march, uh, uh, but campaigning for Greens and later on became a candidate himself. Uh, and he recently published a book called What Does Green Mean? The History, People, and Ideas of the Green Party in Canada and Abroad. So uh, he'll be taking us from a step back and looking at how Canadian green politics compares uh, from a global perspective. Over to you, James. Hello, how's everyone doing? Yeah, so this is my book, looks like that. Uh, I put cute cartoon pictures on it to try to attract attention from a uh, 
uh, more general audience. Um, so yeah, like Kara and Arna both worked in a very, uh, and, and Daph had worked in a very academic, um, or from an academic rep background. And for me, I came from the opposite side, which was a more, uh, I suppose, activist or participator um, background. Um, for me, yeah, I ran in 2017. I, I put my name forward to actually run in an election. Uh, it was in uh, an election for British Columbia, which is the province of Canada that I live in. Um, and the Greens in that one, in that election, uh, got three seats uh, with about one in five uh, people voted green. And because of our strange system that only resulted in three people getting elected, alas. But um, we wound up in a minority government situation where the Greens had a lot more influence in governance than they'd ever had before in Canada. Um, and so afterwards, I was trying to figure out what I could do with the kind of leftover political energy that I had because I did not get elected. Um, and so I decided to try to do some research on questions that had come up during the process of running. Um, what I found while running I've told, I've told people that running for politics really makes you realize how much you don't know about everything um, because you're asked all these questions that you are not an expert on and you don't really know the answer to and you have to go and try to figure out an answer. Uh, and for a lot of these, I was trying to figure out what the answers were from a green perspective and if the greens had internally considered these things in different ways than other political parties, right? So if we were asked about environmental issues or democracy issues, these are things I knew a lot about. But if I was asked about economic issues or infrastructure or a lot of these other things that aren't normally directly associated with green ideological thought, uh, I had trouble uh, saying what the green position was as different from you know, a liberal party or a conservative party or a social democrat party. So I went trying to figure out if anyone had written this down and had basically created a book on this already. Uh, and as far as I could figure out, no one had. Uh, and so I thought, OK, I'm going to start trying to figure this out. And um, because I think that the the best way to learn something is to be able to teach it to someone else, I thought I'm going to write this down as if I was writing a book to teach it. And that way I'll, I'll get it into my own head. Uh, and eventually I wound up getting so far into all this writing, I thought, OK, I'm going to actually publish this as a full on book. Uh, the original idea uh, of the book that I was writing was to be something that would go to a very mass market uh, audience, something that could be like on the local section of a bookstore that people could pick up and be like, oh yeah, I've heard of the Green Party, but I haven't really considered them. Uh, I, I want to see what they're all about and I'll grab this. Uh, as I continued writing it and working through it, it turned out to not be that. Um, and it turned out to be something that was a lot more geared towards people who were already in green political activism uh, and wanted to really get into like the deep down and dirty of the history of the party. Uh, and the reason I wound up writing it in that way was because as I was doing interviews with a lot of these people, I found out that um, a lot of them had stories that had never been written down in any sort of book. Uh, and since the Greens are about 40, 45 years uh, uh, old as a party, uh, a lot of these people are, are can get quite elderly and I don't know if they were ever going to have a chance to write these stories down. Um, and so I thought, OK, if I don't write this stuff down, some of these you know, insights and stories, they might never get written down. So it wound up being a lot more dense and a lot more, uh, I guess, gritty than I anticipated. Um, something that I'm thinking about doing now is basically doing a revised version that's about half as long, that's about half as dense, that has a lot less stats, a lot less uh, information that I think a general audience would not really care about and it would be more of a book uh, of, a, of an overview with ideas and a little bit of history but uh, you know more of the original idea I had for this book. Um, as it is it was it was super easy for me to get in contact with a lot of these people. Um, a lot of the people I interviewed were folks who are not working in any political way anymore, but in the you know 80s and 90s served as like the, the first leader of a, a regional part of the Canadian Green Party who uh, you know worked on the ground uh, in the time when there were no Green Parties to put it together. And they had a lot of insights about like where they were getting their initial uh, inspiration from. Um, and a lot of that led me back to the German Green Party, which is why I wound up contacting folks like Arnie um, to chat about like where did the German Greens ideas come from? And I kind of charted this whole thing backwards to see where the ideological uh, views of the Greens came from, how they made it to Canada, what the challenges were in Canada. Um, and then I just wrote down a lot of the stories about the individual um, people who were involved because I think these people put in a, a huge amount of effort uh, in building these movements and uh, they didn't get a whole lot of like credit in the um, 
political history knowledge of the country, uh, but we should recognize the effort that they put in. Um, so that was very fun. Um, something I didn't get to do in much as much of as much in the book as I would have liked, and something that I'm working on now is to try to think more a lot about uh, green ideas and green and what sets green apart basically from. Uh, the other parties in a political system. Uh, that's something <clears throat> that Kara mentioned a little bit, that a lot of people in Canada see the Greens as like a single issue party, um, which is not, I, I don't believe it's remotely true at all. And I think most people who work in Greens would believe it's not remotely true at all. Uh, but it's still in Canada. I think there's a, there's a concerted effort by other parties to cast the Greens as a single issue party uh, so that they can kind of bury the Green vote and try to take it for themselves. And so how can I challenge that and say there's a lot more to this there's a lot more ideas that the greens are putting forward that aren't being put forward by other parties and uh, i think it would be valuable to canadians and people every, everywhere to really understand some of these ideas um, instead of this you know strict binary that we kind of have in canada of like the left-wing party versus the right-wing party and everything else is just somewhere in the middle i don't think that's an accurate way of describing politics so i'm trying to now think of ways to describe how um you know, a, a political spectrum can be more of a triangle or, or a quadrangle or all these different variety of ideas. Um, that's the question, by the way, that I posed to some of the other uh, panelists here is what uh, what do you think in your countries the um, public knowledge and understanding of the stuff that Greens want to talk about is? Like, do they recognize the ideas that Green talks Greens talk about or are these ideas very foreign to people? Um, and some of them, I think, during the pandemic have been coming forward more, like the idea of universal basic income is something that Greens have been talking about for decades that most people had no idea about. And it was something that was not pushed by any of the other political parties in our political system in Canada. Um, but now this it's really gotten into the news a lot. And so I think it's, it's good for Greens because it's been an idea that they've been pushing that's now gotten um, much more into the public sphere. Uh, so I think I'll stop talking there and uh, happy to answer more questions as we go on. Thanks, James. Just to make sure I understood correctly. So the question you pass on is, uh, can you say that in another way? Yes, the, the question I was passing on was, uh, in your country, do you think people understand who the Greens are in the way that they understand themselves? Like the, the ideas that Greens are putting forward uh, in terms of what Greens see themselves as their place and what they're all about, do you think the public perception of the Greens matches that? Or do you think the public perception of the Greens is very different than what the Greens are actually trying to present? Okay, okay. So how much is there a difference between self-perception versus how the public sees them? Mm -hmm. Okay, good reflection. All right. We have one more speaker in our excellent lineup, Ricky Adachi. So he comes from Japan. So if we continue our journey around the world, just hop over the Pacific and then you'll find Ricky. Uh, he is currently uh, representing Greens Japan in the Asia Pacific Greens Federation. Uh, so he has the role called a counselor. He uh, has been involved in green, the green political movement for 19 years. <laughs> a long time. I met him in about 12 years ago when I first got involved. Uh, he's also run as a candidate in the upper house, but in vain as well. Uh, so I'm sure there are many lessons learned from that experience. And he's published a book titled Green Thoughts to Build a Richer Society Without Economic Growth. So he's uh, an activist, academic, researcher, a man of many hats. Uh, so over to you, Ricky, to tell us about your research. Okay, thank you, Kelly, and thank you um, for having me here. And um, it's very excited. And uh, but um, you know, it's um, 3 a.m. in the morning here in Japan, so I'm just kind of mad. And my PC went mad, and uh, you know, I'm sorry for uh, my troubles. So. Um, as Kelly introduced me, um, my name is Ricky, and uh, I've been um, involved in green political movement for nearly 20 years or something like that. And uh, I ran uh, for the upper house in 2004. And one year before that, I got involved in that movement. And then, um, actually, um, well, as, as Kelly said, I or we contested, we challenged to the national elections for upper house in 2004, but in vain. 
And then after that, the Green Party or uh, a political party like Green Party in other countries um, was um, uh, dissolved once, but um, there's still remained the people with the um, same um, passion and same way of thinking and uh, same ambition. Then we uh, we re reorganize again our, my, ourselves again. And now um, after that, well, that's a long story, but anyway, um, finally we uh, touched down to um, officially a political party uh, which is called Greens Greens Japan uh, now, and it is it was founded in 2012. Uh, it's because um, we we were going to hold the national elections in next year, which means 2013. So um, I published my book, this one. Um, called Green Thoughts or uh, actually what I meant um, with my title is not exactly Green Thoughts, but it's kind of Green Philosophy or something like that. And uh, this was published uh, about four months before the um, voting day. And in that election, we um, <clears throat> Uh, we challenged again to the elections for upper house, but um, actually it was really, really a tough, um, tough fight. So um, I just wanted to contribute in any way, and I thought like, well, I'm originally the, um, an author of some books. Actually, I'm the um, I've been investigating um, a country called Costa Rica in social science, and I have some experiences to publish these kind of books. So um, I decided to contribute to electoral campaign for Greens, uh, writing a book about Greens, but uh, how and what for or uh, what kind of book uh, would it be? And um, at that moment in 2012-2013, the um, main political question in Japan or maybe in the world is how do we have to deal with the nuclear problem or nuclear problem, problem right after the yeah, Fukushima disaster? And actually um, the elections in 2013 was the first one for upper house in Japan. So everybody was talking about the nuclear power plant in terms of uh, a policy. And um, it was so um, right after the incident that everybody, thought, everybody said like, well, no to nuclear power plants and everybody thought like that everybody said like that so um from voters point of view it's like so what's the difference so then um for example um um the ruling party said well said like well not really and the opposition party goes like well mm -hmm, no maybe in the long term and the Communist Party know immediately or something like that. And so there, there was a slight um, difference, but from the voters point of view, um, it's, it's a kind of similar. And of course we say no, I mean, the Greens say no, but the reason is different. And if the reason is different, uh, when the situation changes as time goes by, their reaction or their um, policies might change. Actually, here in Japan, uh, for example, I um, 
for example, the, the, the Communist Party here in Japan uh, once uh, promoted uh, nuclear, nuclear power plant, and then they changed their mind in some way. Uh, well, it was before the Fukushima accident, but anyway, so uh, the policy would change as time goes by. So what we have to see, we have, what we have to take in con consideration is not just policies uh, in the elections or agendas that the politicians and po political parties are talking about, but also uh, the values or let's say ideologies that each political parties have. Then I decided to focus on uh, the philosophy or way of thinking or values of Greens. So that's why I wrote a book titled entitled uh, Greens Thought or Green Philosophy or something like that. And this is all about um, so way of thinking or philosophy or, or what kind of um, values uh, Greens had. And first of all, I write, well, this, this book has like five chapters. And in the first chapter, I explained um, something like, uh, it's like a theoretical part of the philosophy of Greens um, comparing with and capitalism and communism. Um, it is very curious for me. Uh, well, I'm going to talk it just, just later. And in the second chapter, I explained, I wrote about um, the six principles of global Greens. And then in next chapter, third chapter, I um, wrote about the history of or recent history of um, or emerging Green Party in Japan. And there um, I, well, of course, I wrote um, something about how the Green Party, which was formed, which, which was established in 2012, emerged. But uh, I wrote um, in this chapter, I wrote um, my personal history very much. It's like um, half or two thirds of this chapter is about my personal history uh, because um, I have such kind of ideology and I'm kind of a um, green person. So in my mind, there is um, green philosophy and then so I reflected to my book um, like um, how um, a green way of thinking or, or green philosophy uh, was developed in one's mind. So that's a kind of personal history, but it's a kind of um, uh, example of development of green way of thinking or green philosophy. And uh, as I, I think, uh, I told you before, but um, I, I am originally the investigator or scholar uh, who is measuring um, Costa Rica. Costa Rica. And Costa, Costa Rica is a very, very interesting country, and uh, it's a kind of very green country uh, in a way. But um, more interestingly, uh, in Costa Rica, there is no Green Party. And in conclusion, um, they don't need Green Party because um, most of Costa Rican has a kind of green way of thinking, so they don't need uh, Green Party. There are many, uh, of course, uh, political parties like right wing, left wing, or something like that. But um, but in anime, for example, uh, nobody said that uh, we need armed forces for to to defend our country, or we need to cut down the trees for uh, more economic growth or something like that. So the way of thinking, their way of thinking is very, very kind of greeny. And that's really interesting. And I studied philosophy in that country. And going back to Japan, I was a little bit um, frustrated because um, 
um, no politicians nor political parties uh, talk like that. And we, let's say, um, even in the right, uh, no matter uh, which side you are, for example, in the right wing or left wing or uh, whatever, uh, everybody talked about um, the economic growth, like 2% or 3% this year in terms of GDP or something like that. And then I was a little bit frustrated. And uh, <clears throat> so, and then after uh, Fukushima incident, 2011, uh, everybody said like, no, it's, it's a kind of um, reaction, natural reaction to say no after such kind of um, disastral um, incident. And then I have, to, I thought that I need to uh, make clear what's the difference between no from political, political party A and no from political party B and no from Greens. And uh, the difference uh, is based on the philosophy or way of thinking ideology. And uh, going back to the, the first question, ideology, um, <clears throat> I noticed uh, through the investigation on Costa Rica, uh, capitalism and communism may have the same goal, uh, which is the um, eternal economic growth. And from green perspective, green perspective or from the perspective of ordinary Costa Rican, that is something um, weird or something that we have to uh, doubt. Um, so, um, I, um, so those two um, communist and uh, uh, capitalist way of thinking are treated like kind of um, one set of an antagonistic a, um, theme or ideology, but from our point of view, it's kind of same. It seems like same uh, from green perspective. So that's the that's the difference from my perspective. So that's what I wrote in this country. And then lastly, I um, introduced a little bit about um, green. Uh, movement all over the world because um, it is also curious for me um, as a social scientist that green movement um, burst or rose up in many places in the world um, spontaneously and simultaneously. That's really interesting because um, um, in modern times, many political movement or ideological movement rose up in one place at some time with a strong leader or something. And from there, uh, that ideology or um, way of thinking spread all over the world by uh, strong leadership. But um, green is not such a case. So it's very spontaneous and it's very simultaneous. And uh, <clears throat> when we uh, notice that, um, well, it seems like uh, we have many um, friends who are thinking like us, and then they made up uh, a network called Global Greens, right? So that's uh, that kind of um, development of political movement is really um, interesting. So that's how, um, that's what I wrote at last. Um, I think I talk very much, but um, uh, lastly, uh, well, so uh, this is just an introduction for Green Party um, or Green way of thinking, Green philosophy or something like that for uh, voters because I published it before the elections, right? So it's just for uh, the contribution mainly uh, to the electoral campaign. But um, now it is used for um, study for uh, newcomers to, to the Green parties or candidates from Greens or something like that. I think that's all. I, I think I talked too much. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ricky. 
you raised some really interesting points. It, it reflects uh, a pattern I'm seeing amongst all the speakers that your your research reflects your own personal struggle to understand what is green thinking, uh, which is also a struggle that the voters have as well. So our work continues to contribute to the definition or the clarification of, of what is green politics. Um, but nevertheless, as you remarked, there is a, a growing, uh, the green movement is one of the fastest growing political movements in the world. Uh, it's, uh, there's a huge uh, line of request applications to the global greens by uh, groups wanting to form a green party uh, in countries that are new democracies and countries where there was, you know, no green party before. So that's a really interesting development uh, from the uh, the, from the global perspective. So now we move to our discussion section and I'm already seeing lots of questions popping up in the chat box. Uh, and some of you have already mentioned a few already, but I think I'll just start from uh, David's, which came first and was very um, specific. He posed a question to Arnie. Uh, David, would you like to actually take the microphone and ask it yourself? Yeah, thanks, uh, Kelly. So. I mean, one of the the challenges that I think this applies to a lot of green parties is um, losing politicians that will defect to other parties, but also who just give up um, uh, politics. Uh, so one of the things that's troubled me in in writing uh, the Taiwan book was about how to retain that kind of talent and also how to bring back um, uh, lost um, uh, figures. And so the points that Arnie made about uh, sharing that experience of, of different generations of Green parties, I thought was really interesting. So I was wondering whether there were any kind of um, answers to, to this question about holding on to and bringing back uh, talent. That's uh, I think it's a bit of a tragedy the way that it's often lost in Green parties. OK, uh, I wonder if I have a good answer to that. And maybe I, I think probably James has a better observation of that because he he knows some of the German story and knows how to maybe apply it in a different political system. Because when I when I hear you you guys uh, share your experiences and the you know the experiences of green parties in other countries, I realize of course that a lot of the success that the German Greens are building upon is within this framework of proportional voting system. Yeah, and basically what the German Greens managed to achieve was a step by step success of, of growing bigger and bigger, but initially they played to an audience of five to 10% of the electorate. Yeah? And if you want to reach that kind of support or audience, you can specify your political goals, your agenda, your communication towards that audience and try to mobilize that for elections. And if you manage to do so, that's a big success. And this kind of success fuels the party, it gives it energy. And I'm just, you know, I don't have a good answer. What, what in a such a in, a in a much different environment with the first past the poll system, where you aim, where you have to aim for the majority from such a small level, is just, you know, very, very difficult, very different to do. So, I mean, uh, to make a long story short, I think what we we see in the German case is there has been a a long time prof professionalization of the party, yeah, but sticking to the core principle. Uh, of the climate issue, of environmental issue, I think that's the that's one of the key successes of the German Greens, yeah? of not overarching, of aiming for too much and saying we are a party to solve everything. I think that's the the internal observation or the, the internal aim as well. Uh, but in terms and maybe connecting that uh, as my last point to the to the issue that James has raised, the question of self perception and public perception. Mm, I think the, the German Greens make the case that they do want to offer for all issues good solutions, but they are very much aware of how they're being perceived and that they try to perform to that um, perception yeah? and they try to fulfill expectations. Um, and so I think more than ever, it was much weaker before, but more than ever, the ecology and the fighting the climate crisis is at the core of the Green Party in, in Germany. And that's actually other parties are realizing now, since the issue is becoming bigger and bigger, that it's hurting them. Yeah? 
And they have a, like the Germany's conservatives, they are paying right now a, a hefty price for having ignored the issue for such a long time. Do you, do you want me to jump in and, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sure, well, just because uh, Arne, Arne threw it to me a little bit there. Um, so yeah, I think the, the difference between a, a, a proportionally elected system and a first past the post system in terms of retaining people is titanic. Because I think in on our system, it's just demoralizing loss after demoralizing loss because the system is built to, to do that. Uh, and something I, I point out, which is really strange always for me, um, Ke Kelly, you're in, in Sweden, and uh, Sweden has, or I guess had the Greens in government until last week. Um, but the Greens, I believe, in the last Swedish election got 5% or something like that and elected a, a solid group of MPs who then joined the government. And, you know, it was it ba basically a, a, a success in order to get into a position of government there. Um, in my province of British Columbia, in the last election, the Greens got almost 20 percent so almost the party was almost four times as popular as say the swedish greens or even the german greens in a lot of states in which they participate in government uh but in that last election we elected two people and got completely shut out of everything um and so signing up to be a candidate uh and to be a participant in a first past the post system is uh, a really difficult thing to ask of someone um, because we have 87 individual districts in BC and in maybe a dozen of those districts did we consider ourselves competitive. So we maybe had six candidates that were realistically running an election to be elected and 80 candidates that almost certainly knew that they were not going to be elected but still had to take a month off of work, still had to put in a huge amount of money to run for office, still had to you know deal with the incredible nastiness of attacks by other political parties, which in Canada is quite bad. Uh, and so trying to attract people who are willing to sign up for that type of punishment for what they believe in is is really hard. And it's something I think in the Greens we've we've suffered a lot. And I think we also tend to attract in BC some uh, interesting folks because <laughs> the, the kind of people who are willing to do that are not necessarily the kind of people that you want to be running, but um, sometimes you take whatever help you can get and later on you realize, okay, perhaps we don't actually want to associate ourselves much with some of these people. Uh, so it's it's a quite difficult thing that we have to put up with here. And I don't know if that's the case in proportional systems or if there is just a lot more positive and they attract a lot of people that are willing to stick around more. Kara, I see you have your hand up. Oh, still muted, Kara. I mean, I should know after teaching Zoom. Um, yes, I agree with with all of this, uh, what um, James has been saying and Arnie also. And there's one other aspect on, that I've been writing. I was going, when I was doing the interviews with the uh, candidates that, and leaders, is that um, of the Green Party. And something that was fortunate for the Green Party of Canada and NBC was that um, the, the setup, the regulations on party financing. Now in other countries, you have public subsidies for party financing. In Canada, we had temporarily for a short period of time, and our leader at the time was, was um, clever enough to encourage people to vote for the Greens, saying, you know, this will help to, to, to uh, increase our coffers, $1.75 per vote. Uh, but unfortunately, then we had a change of government and the Conservative Party at the time removed the per vote subsidy. And but the Greens were still able to carry on uh, raising enough money to keep going. So that in itself is, is an important uh, institutional uh, constraint. Uh, it creates a dynamic whether some parties can make through or not. The other thing is the, the role of the media and the social media. Now we've had social media come into it. But the, the access to the leaders' debates, when um, uh, candidate, uh, candidates and leaders uh, can access. And so these are two, and that's my, one of my questions I have for the panelists, especially Dafid, in his excellent discussion um, of the uh, development of the party and, and the thresholds, which Van Holt uh, first developed, and then he ex ex explored it further and, and improved upon it. And I just thought we could add another a couple of uh, characteristics there, thresholds, is being able to raise enough money is one of the other thresholds, and having uh, being part of the discourse in the media on a regular basis. It's still a challenge for the Greens, 
uh, sometimes they make they make it uh, unfortunately for the wrong reasons uh, when there's uh, as there is currently right now some inter-party fighting. Um, and uh, I had another question which relates to the other comments that have been made, and that is, I've been reading it actually an article in the Global Mail by written by the one of the first um, founders of the Green Party of Canada, Trevor Hancock, who's a professor at UVic, and he said that. The Green Party of Canada has lost its way in a sense. He says, we're losing a bit of a plot as to what Green Party Green Parties are about. And as you know, there, you might have heard about the recent uh, kerfuffle about um, uh, the foreign policy positions uh, of some of the some of the, uh, the elected officials and our leader. And and that has really taken over the discussion. When here we have the heat wave here in BC. And we perhaps the Greens should be focusing on climate change more, and, and go back to their the foundation core of their their, their raison d'être. Um, and he said, "Well, we need to explain what it means to have one planet economy, one planet society. How do you live within the limits of the planet and do so in a way that is socially just?" He said, "We've it's good to have these other issues, but maybe to have the the essence of climate change in the middle of it." And so I'm in, I'm very interested in reading um, the second book of Arnie's book on um, uh, governing uh, ecologically and the Greens governing, because here in Canada, in BC, we just recently had the BC Greens and the NDP got in, in uh, form of a common supply agreement, which unfortunately fell through, and they're no longer in government. The Greens, but they were for a while, and I wanted to explore in my book, looking at what they've what did they accomplish uh, while in government? How they worked with the social, uh, the social democratic party, and the possibility they could have worked actually with the BC Liberals, which is more of a, of a center right party. But I know, reading some of Arnie's work, that in fact uh, they can Greens can work with either, and that's what makes the Greens so fascinating. They're neither left nor right, uh, but what are they? And I think that perhaps some of these green parties, like the one in Canada, are still developing the philosophy, what they're really about. Thank you. Thanks, Kara. I'll just um, add a little side note about the Swedish Greens. The Greens are still in government, but the, the hot news today, the headline is that the Prime Minister stepped down due to a, a vote of no confidence. Um, so the next step is that the Speaker of the House will try to facilitate uh, a new agreement amongst the eight political parties that are in Parliament. I, I oversimplified, sorry, yes. <laughs> uh, no, we, we still have uh, power and we may still as well because a new election is the last thing anyone wants really. Um, so it's exciting times. But uh, Kara mentions an interesting question about, you know, um, what sort of research is needed now? And I noted that in the chat, Leah Kott, who is the uh, founder of the Green Party in Pakistan, asked the question about um, how how could we help uh, this sort of research develop in, in other countries where there is uh, a lack of, of formal academic work being done. Like in Pakistan, there are no courses or research that he's aware of that uh, is doing the sort of research that you're doing in green politics. So. Uh, it's an open question to any of you. Where, what do you think the world needs next in terms of uh, our work, our our research, our skills, our publishing? I see David's hand hand going up. Over to you, David. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, in response to that one, I mean that that's often a great opportunity. The fact that we have this kind of gap, that no one's really done this kind of research before. Um, so that can be really uh, exciting and the, the possibility of looking to see whether these kind of theories or frameworks that have been developed mainly in European cases actually work uh, for, for example, uh, Asian cases and maybe how we need to uh, adjust those theories or frameworks I think can be really um, uh, exciting and uh, it means that um, uh, studies in these kind of emerging countries can actually um, talk a language that makes sense to uh, political scientists, for example, in uh, European or North American cases. So I think that's it's something that really enriches um, our our field. 
Um, and it kind of builds on that kind of the, it's kind of international nature of um, of green. So I think that's that's for me that's, that's really uh, exciting. Yes, James. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was a, a bunch of ideas in there that are interesting. And in terms of like the the academic literacy in in other countries, I'm not sure what comes first, either the the uh, literacy about green issues among academics or the literacy about green issues among the media. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time thinking about it in the media. Um, something I, I wrote about in my book was that in the the last election that we did, um, there was only one person in the the media covering the this election that had actually read the green platform, uh, <laughs> and that. Uh, everyone else who was trying to cover green issues in any way routed their questions through that one guy who is a lovely man, but I don't know if he fully understood the green issues well enough to basically be our spokesperson, which is kind of the job that he got put into because he was the only person in the media who was bothering to take the time to kind of understand what we were talking about. Um, and so I, I don't know if we need to try to push literacy of the, the the media pundits to try to get people who understand these issues into places where they're talking on the talk shows and stuff like that and if that will maybe drive research interest or if it's the other way around where if we can get research scientists um, like I know um, in Canada in the past couple of years we got the first uh, person to be officially assigned the Canada Research Chair in Ecological Economics. We didn't have that as a research chair before. Um, now that we have that, I'm hoping that maybe the media will pick up on some of the things that are coming out of that, you know, elevated bit of of uh, of academic um, interest or whatever. Um, so yeah, I don't know which way it goes, but probably both pushing each other. Okay. Kara? Do you want to pick up on that? Yes, I think one of the reasons perhaps is one is that, as I said, this um, fact that some of the other parties and some of the pundits, are unfortunately, are also involved in this and they have biases, uh, favorites. Um, and so they feel that the, the NDP or the liberals or the, the other progressive parties are good enough. Um, and the other the other part of it is that there is a desire for, which is a good thing, um, to talk about the environmental issues from a very objective standpoint. And the Greens have been associated with the environmental movement. And so they're thinking of them as these hippie fringe people that climb trees uh, and they don't see them as a serious entity. Uh, and that was the other question I had. I, I found it very, very interesting. I, I'm rereading um, James Marshall's book and and I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed it now more than once. And so I, I I, it's, it's a great pleasure and uh, because he has he certainly has done a very thorough discussion with some of the um, people who started the party uh, in BC for example and at, the, and at the federal level and I wanted to know more that was a question I had from for James as well um, what is the the because uh, it's as uh, David said it for the case of Taiwan also it's a very ambiguous relationship the relationship between the environmental movement and the party, and there's all this literature about movement parties. What, how, how does that work in Canada? What is it like? Is it the relationship? Ooh. Yeah, I'll jump in there. Uh, it's very strange in Canada. Because of our electoral system, the environmental movement and the various environmental NGOs, I have noticed, tend to align themselves with parties that have their goals a lot less than the Greens do. Like we'll we'll see that we'll, there'll be some uh, um, requests that come out of environmental movement, and the Greens will say like, yes, 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 we are on board with all of that, and then we'll see this environmental movement throwing their entire weight behind uh, one of the bigger parties that have said no to half of their demands, uh, and that's because from a strategic standpoint, there's always this this uh, thing that's going on in the environmental movement to try to figure out. You know, should we go for the the and and you know put our neck out for a party that's probably not going to win seats, uh, or are we going to put our neck out for one that probably is, but that isn't following what we're actually asking them? And I don't know if that's the case in Germany, uh, where the Greens do win seats, but in Canada, it's a it's a bizarre self-reinforcing cycle, I think, where the Greens aren't treated seriously because they're believed to not be serious, and then that just keeps going in circles, and there's got to break it somewhere, and I don't know where that happens. So yeah, I'd like to ask Aaron actually about that, about environmental movements in general. 
Yeah, that's a, a complex relationship and it most often depends also on the constellation of are the Greens in government or in the opposition. Yeah. So when I was an assistant uh, on the national level in the Greens governed on the national level in Germany from 1998 to 2005. Uh, and back at the time, they were like a, a five to eight percent, five to eight percent party. So they joined a center-left government, being the very small partner, basically being responsible for environmental issues, so, such as the nuclear phase-out, renewable energy, ecological tax reform. Those were the the major projects for the Greens. And uh, once they, it was the first time they entered government. And they raised huge expectations in the environmental movement and they failed miserably, so to say. Yeah, so there was a big uh, disappointment time and uh, alienation almost with the environmental movement and the Green Party. Now, this is uh, 20 years ago and we are now in a, in a situation where the Greens have a, a strong governing record on the on the state level. Um, but we have also a new generation of activists, the Fridays for Future movement is very strong in Germany, is very active uh, and is putting a lot of pressure on the issue and is raising the issue to become the number one issue for most voters actually. Yeah? So they have a huge impact, I think, the, the new generation, despite the, the difficult conditions during the pandemic. Uh, but we will come into a, a similar situation. We will come into a situation that the Greens are likely enter to enter government as a 20% party but joining uh, a, a center-right coalition, this time with the Conservatives maybe, who are around 30%. So basically, the Greens cannot pursue their, their agenda to 100%, and there will be compromises uh, within the government. And it will be a big challenge for, you know, to, uh, for the, I'm, I'm not putting it single-sidedly onto the movement, the challenge, but the challenge will be basically that you have one actor in government trying to pursue or push through the agenda and another one pushing from outside. Yeah? And how do you how do you organize that relationship to be fertile and that the the criticism outside does not, you know, put the put the actor in government down? This is what happened 20 years ago. Yeah? Basically, the movement was disappointed. They turned away from the Greens and the Greens were performing weaker and weaker in the government. I mean, they they would describe it differently today, but I, just to make it short. Uh, and so I think it's not it's uh, it's it's quite a task actually to to find a good way of, of job sharing of how you can, you know, combine forces from within Parliament and, and outside. It's something that some of the German Greens told me while I was doing research that I thought was very funny was they found it easier from a political perspective, political perspective to work with the center right parties as opposed to the center left parties because the expectation was just so much lower <laughs> amongst the public. Like yes. when they worked with the CDU, the public thought, oh, the Greens aren't going to be able to get anything done. Whereas when they worked with the, the SPD, the public said, all right, everything's going to happen. And they, you know, so there was just a lot less expectation put on them, and that was a bizarre experience for them. Yeah, I think this connects well to uh, a question Arnie put on the chat box um, as we speak about external forces influencing the Greens or the destiny of the Greens or how we understand the Greens. Um, Arnie, could you ask that question yourself about the right wing populist movement? I was opposed to other speakers. Yeah, so uh, uh, what I observe in, in Western Europe and in the United States, the countries that I follow most is obviously in the last years there has been a, a rise in populism and mostly right wing populism. Uh, and in, in, in political systems like Germany, this also comes with a fragmentation of the political system. No? So we today we have six parties established uh, in the parliament. Um, a fragmentation and the, the big 10 parties have become much smaller. Um, and within the Germany systems, the, the Greens basically have moved to one side of the spectrum and the opposite side is the right wing populist party, the what is called alternative for Deutschland. Yeah, and somewhat, I mean, there are underlying factors of, of this political shift underneath, but in general, like the, 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 the cheap conclusion or the cheap observation that I have is that the Greens actually in Germany benefit from this because unlike the big 10 parties, the Greens have a very clear profile today. They are 
they are uh, refugee friendly, they're pro-European, they're fighting the climate crisis. They see an, a strong role for the for the government. Yeah? Uh, while the, the, the right wing, the right extreme has the opposite program. And the party, the other parties are moving in between and have different wings within their own parties. So for the for the Greens, they it's like a you know it's not like a, a gift, but they 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 somehow benefit from this new constellation. You know? and I'm I'm just curious how this must be playing out differently in in other political systems, yeah, where you have mostly you have mainly two parties or maybe three parties. But uh, I'm I'm just curious how how it affects Greens in other countries. David. Yeah, I think the um, uh, for the Green parties in the Taiwan case, the the populism issue is a relatively new one. Uh, more of a challenge has been that um, right at the start, pro, uh, post democratic transition, there already was a mainstream pro environmental party. Uh, so there already was a anti-nuclear uh, party on the party system. Um, and um, how do you kind of gain ownership of that environmental issue when you already have um, a mainstream party that has that, that kind of uh, position? Um, of course, when that mainstream party comes into office, um, then you get that kind of alienation that, that Arnie talked about. Um, but um, it's it's still a an issue, and then even even today we have quite a lot of competition, uh, not only from that mainstream party that is actually currently in power, but also other kind of movement parties uh, that are competing for um, uh, for those kind of uh, votes. So in in many ways in the Taiwanese system, it's actually become much more competitive, even though uh, public opinion has actually moved in the same direction. In, so in many ways, the, the Greens have won the argument on issues such as um, uh, same sex marriage or um, uh, environmental consciousness, but the market has just become so much more um, uh, competitive. Thanks. I see uh, Karen James have also put their hands up, but I want to ask Ricky what uh, he's noticing in Japan. Is there a rise of right wing populism there? And if yes, how is it impacting the Greens? Well, yeah, um, actually, uh, we can observe a uh, very um, big, um, how to say, increase of such kind of um, right wing populism um, by ruling party. So that's kind of um, um, weird, not not like uh, AFD in, in Germany or something like that, uh, but um, <clears throat> Such kind of movement. Um, I mean, the the ruling party, the LDP, Labour Democratic Party here in Japan, is kind of um, supporting such kind of um, ultra right uh, way of um, um, how to say thinking. For example, um, attacking China or. Korea or something like that. So the problem is that we're um, here in Japan, at least here in Japan, we're still living in the Cold War era. So um, um, first of all, it's, it's the, the atmosphere is like, first of all, we have to fight with uh, communism or we have to fight with um, commun communism China or something. They are enemy or something like that. So the interesting thing is, for example, uh, when I ran for candidacy in 2003, 2004, um, many such kind of, um, I had some questions from such kind of sectors, like how do you think about the um, human virus, uh, human rights violation in, in China, in uh, Tibet or something like that? And uh, I say, of course, it's not good because um, it, it's obvious the, the human rights violation is not good in anywhere in the world. Okay, so then you are um, our friends like that. So um, I was uh, really welcomed by um, a certain um, such kind of um, populist or ultra right group, but in uh, on the other hand, at the same time, I was labeled like um, ultra leftist or something like that because. Um, I'm, you know, um, 
I was a little bit popular uh, for uh, famous for um, studying uh, Costa Rica, which uh, which abolished the army and which sounds like very leftist or something like that. So um, the people here in Japan um, still think or still um, are stuck into the um, cold era way of thinking. And uh, so I think it doesn't, Japanese case doesn't really match to this kind of um, discussion or the situation is completely uh, different from my part of view or it's more complicated or let's say it's more primitive. It's not the uh, it's not 21st century here in Japan. <laughs> it's a different context. Yeah. Uh, next, Kara, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, that was a very good question uh, that Marie posed. And then in the, we have a People's Party of Canada, which just ran a few candidates in the last um, federal election that would be on the right, um, farther right, as well as their elements within the Conservative Party. And actually, in the case of the Canadian, Canadian Greens, I would say it would hurt them. And that's because of the politics of fear that works and the, uh, and the way that with this negative strategic voting that we have in Canada because of the electoral system, people are afraid that these elements could take over. Uh, if there are not enough uh, support for the larger progressive parties and uh, the left. Uh, so unfortunately, it has it has dampened enthusiasm for the Greens. Even though the Greens can portray themselves as those who are most committed to science and to a, a more ethical uh, governing um, approach process uh, in contrast to the populists who are not. But this has not really worked in their advantage because of the, of the people that are fearful of, of, of wasting their vote or, or um, taking away votes from uh, making it possible for a, a majority, a conservative majority to come in that uh, would have a, a, a right wing populist agenda that would be counter the environment and counter, would bring in policies that are perhaps against uh, women's rights or anti immigration. Okay. James, would you like yeah, to add to that? Uh, yeah, uh, that was a good analysis by Kara. Uh, I, I, the, the politics of fear is, I think, really big. There was a um, polling result that came out after one of the last provincial elections in which they asked people, did you primarily vote for the candidate you wanted or did you primarily vote to block the candidate you really didn't want? And a majority said that they voted out of fear to not to try to block whoever they didn't like. Uh, and so I think if you look back at Canadian elections, the Greens do better whenever there's not a very scary conservative uh, that's that's out there. Um, and certainly in my circles, most people are motivated by fear of what a certain party could do. And the Conservative Party in Canada still to a large extent has has captured the populist right as part of them. Um, as Kara said, we do have the People's Party, which is a new party in the last election uh, formed by a disgruntled conservative leadership candidate um, who uh, they got about 3% elected no one. Um, so most of that energy is still inside the, the mainstream conservative party. And I think that scares a lot of people away from voting green and they say, oh, I have to vote liberal or whatever this time and then I'll vote green next time and we, we hear that a huge amount. Uh, my other random little funny anecdote is uh, when this one disgruntled conservative left to form this new populist party, uh, he became an independent member of parliament, not associated with the party because it was just the one of him. Um, and the Greens in our parliament are also not an official party because you have to have a certain number of people in order to qualify for that designation. Uh, and so the alt-right party leader and our Green Party leader were sat next to each other in parliament for about a year and a half. Um, and I, I talked to her a bit and like he'd lean over and show her things that he was working on and she'd just be so exhausted from having to sit next to this guy. Um, and in the, in the same case during the last election, 
uh, we had debates for local candidates. And for instance, we had one in my area specifically on environmental issues. And for fairness sake, they had to invite the populist right wing party, which I thought was very strange because her position was that there are no environment problems and inviting someone to an environmental debate who's just going to yell about how we shouldn't be having this debate was it pretty much derailed the entire thing. And there were people walking out because just nothing was getting done because of this disruptive influence there. So, yeah, it's frustrating. Hmm. Looking at the question from another angle, um, David, uh, David wrote in the chat box uh, a question on how has um, immigrant communities impacted green parties? Uh, David, do you want to expand, uh, clarify your question, Penny? Yeah, because in, in one of the uh, the comments, James mentioned the fact that there is a, such a large uh, Indian community in uh, in Canada. So that kind of made me think about this because it, it does it is something that applies to I think all the cases that we're looking at in uh, in Sweden, in Germany, even in, in Japan and, and Taiwan. We have a growing uh, immigrant immigrant community, uh, and we often do see kind of anti-immigrant rhetoric, uh, even in in some of our Asian. Uh, cases. So is this an opportunity for um, uh, Green parties? And another, another kind of related uh, one that also so I think I picked up in James's book was about Indigenous people um, and the way that uh, Green parties I think have a really important role to play in terms of uh, protecting the rights of Indigenous uh, peoples. Um, and I know that Taiwan's party has tried this but it's 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 varied again uh, over time depending on um, the kind of the makeup for the party and at certain times it has been more uh, uh, successful. So I was just curious about whether others had any thoughts on uh, these two kind of dimensions, the indigenous one and also the uh, the, the potential for attracting immigrant um, uh, communities. Good one. Who would like to hey, Kara, put your hand up first. Oh, your microphone, Kara. Sorry, I have actually looked at some of the data that I received in terms of voters and uh, and supporters and the, the Greens, unfortunately, I have uh, compared to the other parties, a very a small, much smaller percentage of um, people from uh, new immigrant communities as yet. They are developing this. They are making inroads and in Ontario, for example, they have ha have new uh, high profile candidates who are from Indian descent. But um, one of the, to start with is that new immigrants in Canada, uh, many of them are not involved in politics of any kind. They're 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 busy uh, with other things. They're not as well integrated yet, and so the Green Party is even something even newer that they will not know what it is, uh, especially if they come from a country where they haven't had the Green Parties as high profile. And the other thing is that they are very fearful that the Greens will mean a uh, tanking economy. It will threaten the economy. And so if the Green Party wants to succeed, and there was quite a discussion actually in some of the recent conventions uh, here in BC, and I'm sure James will talk more about more than me on that, is, is that they have to show that one can have a strong economy as well as a, a more healthy environment. They're, the two come kind of hand in hand. Because here in Canada, we depend a lot on, unfortunately still on the non-green economy, on the development resource extraction. Uh, and uh, there, there has been uh, the Greens have been the ones that have been against the pipelines, and it was pronounced, and against the LNG, uh, liquid natural gas uh, shipments to out to out the staples economy, out to Asia, out to other parts of the world, and they're more focused on the local economy. Um, but that is going against the the what the bulk of the Canadian economy is, is built based on. Now the green economy is developing, and actually I found from my survey of members that many of the greens, that's how the greens in Canada differ perhaps from the greens in other countries, including Germany, uh, is that we have more self-employed and more um, people employed in the private sector, but in the small businesses, the new startups uh, that are in the, um, or their organic farmers, or their uh, people employed in um, advanced technologies, green building, and so they support the Green Party because the Green Party is, is they hope, going to influence the other parties to bring in policies that are more uh, uh, supportive of, of a greener economy in Canada. Uh, and, but the green economy is actually quite small still in Canada. 
And for the second point about the indigenous people, that is true that they have uh, uh, been supportive of, of indigenous rights, but not, indig not all indigenous people are in favor of, uh, are, are, are more, there's, there are indigenous groups that are, want development and very quick development because they're, they have a lot to, to invest in their uh, infrastructure and their, um, their economies. And so they want to go ahead with the traditional non-green, more um, petrochemical focused, which goes at odds with what the, the greens want to do, which is to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so there are sometimes they're at odds and not all greens and in, indigenous people are together and united. Thanks, Kara. I put my hand up because this is a topic that I was passionate about when I was uh, working with the Global Greens. I really saw the, the potential for green parties to work together to, to talk to their populations, both at home, but also in the countries where they've immigrated to. And that I wanted to see uh, a robust international secretariat in, of each green party, which consisted of uh, people of different nationalities who could speak to the different immigrant communities in their own language, in their own culture, and who could help interpret how the issues in their new home country could be understood through uh, a context of the country they came from. So to help make that connection internationally. Uh, so that's a project I would love to see uh, continue to, to develop. It was quite a complex uh, web of connections, but I definitely think it's possible. And the Global Greens and the Green, green Parties um, are the best, I guess, uh, set up for that because we're so global, globally connected to start with. So if anybody wants to join me on that project, just get in contact. Great, James. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I see Ricky has had his hand up. Um, and I also note that we are have about 15 minutes to the end of our two hour session. Time flies and you're having fun. So I wanted to just sort of end with a little uh, kind of discussion, short discussion about where to from here. What are your thoughts about future projects, opportunities for working together, opportunities to strengthen this field uh, in the future, invitations to the world <laughs> to help you on your passion. Uh, so the, that's a round of questions I'll ask to all the speakers after Ricky. So first, over to you, Ricky. Okay. Um, well, um, <clears throat> um, regarding the um, the immigrants, uh, first of all, um, I think um, in, here in Japan we can observe uh, very different aspects because um, uh, Japan is such an exclusive country. And uh, uh, actually, we accept many immigrants from other countries, especially from um, Southeast Asia. But um, the government never uh, gives them uh, the voting right. It's almost a slave contract. It's really, really um, bad. But um, thinking of that, um, we noticed that um, we have such kind of uh, problem of uh, the, the difference of um, international difference um, in terms of economy and society or um, something like that, and uh, which we didn't, we did never notice before we accept the immigrants because uh, Japan has been so close, exclusive country that um, here in Japan, many Japanese people believe that here in Japan, only Japanese people live. So, and um, now we we can see um, many nationalities, people from uh, many nations, many nationalities, who has many nationalities you know, all around uh, our country because um, they are mainly working in a convenience store, which is all around Japan, and um, some of them noticed the importance or the meaning of diversity for the first time in Japanese um, history. So that's one of the contribution um, like this, right? And the other thing is that um, 
um, there are so many, there are some um, green members abroad here in Japan. So um, there is a, it's a very little thing, but there is very little um, international exchange um, experience here in Japan. For example, I have a friend from uh, New Zealand Greens, and uh, I have another friend from French Greens around here. And uh, it, um, they contribute so much to develop what is Greens, I mean, the ideology or philosophy of Greens to the member of Greens Japan. Because the, uh, the Greens Japan, the members of Greens Japan is like a, a group of um, civil movement or something like that. So they have their only uh, their uh, own uh, specific specific issues like um, no war or uh, no to nu uh, nuclear power plants or something like that. But um, it's not integrated so much in terms of philosophy or something. So um, such kind of international um, friends gives us a um, integrated image of philosophy, a way of thinking. Um, of greens so that's a kind of um a little bit contribution but um so as i said we're still in the primitive era so at first we have to understand what the diversity is so that's kind of, kind of first step and they don't have uh, voting rights so we had to uh, as a greens we had to fight for uh, their uh, rights right that's the first thing for greens and to close uh, my statement or my argument. Well, um, <clears throat> actually, Greens in Japan is not treated as a political party officially because um, to be treated a political party officially, we have to, ha we have to get at least 2% of the um, total vote in latest elections, which means uh, more than like uh, 1 million votes, or uh, we have to have at least five MPs, uh, which is not possible. So um, it's very uh, tough. And uh, as we are not treated as an official political party, even though we, we registered as a political party, um, people don't recognize that we are a political party. And if uh, some candidates, some um, uh, members of city councillors grew up and they they got the um, um, position of mayor, for for example, um, they suddenly stop call themselves Greens, and they call they started to call themselves as independents because it's better for the elections. So what what I'm thinking about is. Um, to establish in this in this society, Japanese society, to establish the politics by um, political parties, uh, which had um, each of which has some kind of ideology or philosophy of a way of thinking, um, not um, bothering with um, uh, their current issues, like for example, now Olymp Olympic or pandemic or something like that, but we have to have long-term ideology or uh, way of thinking or something like that. So that's what uh, I wanted to um, ask uh, with my book. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Ricky. And I believe Ricky's on the International Secretariat of Greens Japan. So if you want to get in touch with the, the party, you can also contact Ricky to help build them up. All right. More than so welcome. A fast maximum two minutes per speaker. Just a wish to the universe or statement about what you want to work on next in this field or what you want help on. We'll start with James. Sure. 
Um, what I'm working on now is how to translate green ideas to kind of a mass market audience and how to reach different groups of people who have maybe never considered some of these ideas before. Um, we don't have time. I was going to talk about the immigrant one just because I think it's really interesting how we communicate these ideas to people from various different cultural backgrounds. And so if anyone has insights on that, I know we had a few people from India Greens. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, context in there in the you know history and even religion of, of Indian uh, culture that has green connections. Uh, we have a lot of people here from uh, Taiwan studies. I think there's a lot probably that exists um, perhaps in, in Taiwanese and Chinese history, including I think especially in Taoism. I've been reading a lot about you know some of the green connections that exist uh, in um, this because a lot of the time when we talk about our green ideas, we're doing it from a very kind of Christian centric background because there's been so much green development in Europe where there's a Christian minority. So a lot of just the ways we talk about our ideas are filtered through our own cultures. Um, so I'm quite interested in how other people can communicate these things and specifically if there's terms and ideas that people understand that don't exist in English, but that would really mean a lot to someone who comes from a different language community. Because I know there's a lot of words in English that uh, unless you understand the cultural background of them, you might not understand the depth of them. And I'm sure there's words like that in Chinese and in Hindi and in, in many other languages. And I, I want to know them so that when I talk to people, I can uh, you know, reference these things and, and come from a place where they already have a bit of understanding of what we're talking about. Um, and then I'm just trying to think about uh, green economics and green uh, answers to things beyond purely, you know, talking about trees or talking about plants. Like, how does our uh, understanding of economics play into the climate crisis and how can we talk about green economic ideas? So I'm thinking a lot about that as well. Anyone wants to talk about that? Hit me up. Great. Next, Arnie. Yes. Uh, over the next month, uh, I in my work, I try to help the Germany's climate movement to turn the election into a climate victory. So we basically have 300 uh, districts and 60 of them are climate relevant and the Greens might end up, you know, winning even up to 40 districts seats uh, directly. But uh, in, in terms of uh, Green Party research, I, I bring in a European perspective. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the right audience here. But there, are, but there are two ideas that are popping up to my mind what is worthwhile to research further. One is that there's currently uh, six or seven, in six or seven uh, European member states, the Greens are in government, and it would be worthwhile to evaluate their experience and compare that. Swedish Greens, Luxembourg, Austria, Finland, Ireland, Belgium, and maybe Germany. So that's one, uh, one idea. And the other one is a, a transatlantic project. I think the, obviously, Democracy in the United States is at a, in a stage of deep crisis, uh, but there's also attempts to to modernize democracy in the United States and on the state level, on the municipal level. Um, basically, there are reform attempts to make democracy more functional and increase representation. Yeah, and this could be done by proportional voting system, can be done by ranked choice, which, which is used in Alaska and in Maine already. Uh, and so I think these are uh, questions of how does a democracy function and how does the political system function? And these are um, Stellschrauben, these are little, you know, these are little um, switches that impact also perspective of, of green policy. And I think it's this is an upcoming issue. Uh, and when once we see more energy in this going on in the United States, I think this will have a also an international dimension or international reference. Good. Next, Kara. Yes. Yes, um, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the, our discussions today and they're very stimulating. I'm in the process of completing my book. And um, it's a, very timely because we are, the federal election is eminent now uh, and uh, in, in the fall. Um, and while there's been the pandemic, um, now with the heat wave and uh, other um, the, the melting of the ice pack, there's going to be a, ch a change also towards focus more on climate change, I think, in the election. We had an ideal time last time, the last election, 2019, but the Greens didn't make their breakthrough. So what I want to explore um, is to find out what, what I can find out why it didn't happen and so that I can perhaps um, give some, provide some kind of information to the party uh, that they can utilize. Um, and I've been interviewing candidates as well as, as uh, looking at some of the survey data that I have. Um, also, I've been 
focusing on what the, what it means to be green because we've had um, an influx of people coming into the party from other parties, uh, and, um, and and I want to uh, compare their perspective um, with those who have been in the party for a very long time, or founding members, and how has the Green Party developed over time and evolved. Uh, and um, here it's an ideal location because in British Columbia we have we've had a very close uh, election where we the Greens have nearly won but they didn't quite make it. So I'd like to look at the campaign strategy and a lot of it has to do with how they position themselves relative to the NDP and the Liberals who also claim that they are green in some ways. Thank you. Great. And last but not least, David. Great. Um, when we finish a, a project, uh, we often said, what are you going to do next? But I'm not at that stage yet. I'm, I'm enjoying this project so much that I don't want it to stop. So I mentioned that I'm doing the uh, working on the Chinese version of the book, but I think there's lots of other avenues that could be taken. I think one is looking comparatively. Um, uh, so long as there's similar cases, so potentially Taiwan, Japan, South Korean Green Party would be a really interesting um, uh, comparison. Uh, and another thing that I think comes out a lot from our discussion today is about looking for uh, practical solutions um, from maybe from failed campaigns. What can we learn? Um, how could Green parties improve their relationship with social movements? Um, and a final one that I think could be really interesting is uh, something on green diplomacy. Um, because I think that's one of the really exciting things and about the, the Greens and a lot of people I've interviewed have actually found that has been the most meaningful element of being involved in the, in the Greens. That kind of international engagement while in contrast electoral politics, I think as James has mentioned in the single member district can be really, really frustrating. But the, the joy from that kind of international engagement came through so much in a lot of my interviews. So I think there's a, a lot of things to um, to do. And I think it's why I think uh, it's such an enjoyable thing to research. Indeed, that's certainly why I got involved. Fell in love with the global element and changed my life forever for the better. Uh, so with that, I want to thank David for bringing us together in the Center for Taiwan Studies for making this uh, platform uh, possible, making it happen. Thank you. Uh, so please join me in a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you for David and the study and everybody.